by now, the world at large is pretty much familiar with the blues turnaround. While this is commonly used at the end of a 12-bar blues to turn us around or bring us back to the beginning of a progression, this blues phrase goes beyond being just a turnaround. It's, for example, commonly used among jazz musicians within the context, respectively, of the one dominant seven, four dominant seven, and five dominant seven, used in parallel fashion on each of these chords. In this video, we'll be getting deeper into the blues turnaround, and I'll be showing you examples of this and how it expresses what I have called in my Blues Clues series, extreme chromaticism in the blues. A good example of how this is employed, at least on the one dominant seven and four dominant seven in this case, is expressed in the main melody of the Thelonious Monk tune, Blue Monk. I'll link it in the show notes, give it a listen. We're gonna discover now how the decatonic blues model includes the turnarounds on all three chords, one dominant seven, four dominant seven, and five dominant seven. In this demonstration, I'm going to show you that the blues turnaround can either descend or ascend depending on taste. First, the turnaround on A7. Right out of the decatonic model. Now, let's see if we get it for the D7. that works, so let's find out if we get it for the E7 chord. Another real-world example of these blues turnarounds being used on each chord of a blues progression, aside from Thelonious Monk's song, can be found in the very old Beatles song written by George Harrison called You Like Me Too Much. In this piece, at least during the solo section, all of the turnarounds are expressed, save for one diatonic phrase in the 11th measure. But everything else is following the blues turnaround principles. If you listen to the song, you'll hear a really fun and playful call and response exchange between George Harrison on guitar and George Martin, their producer, on piano. Harrison plays the phrases in the first and every odd measure after that, the even-numbered measures are Martin's responses on piano. For copyright reasons, I can't play you the original clip. I'll link it. But I did uh, bother to put together a little MIDI piano presentation of this back and forth, which I'm going to show you right now. With all of the half steps we've seen in the decatonic model, we can pretty much come to the conclusion that the blues is highly chromatic. I've said before that at one and the same time, the blues is the most basic and simple form to play through and also the most sophisticated. As a simple form to play through, you have a root chord, let's say G. Uh, you play through a 12 bar blues using just a G minor pentatonic. Just one pentatonic scale to play blues? Awesome. That's so simple. But then again, blues can be incredibly sophisticated in ways more so than jazz. The reason I say this is that non-blues chord progressions in a reasonably tonal jazz piece can be explained pretty much easily through music theory, but blues has never really had a systematic theory. Jazz musicians, being highly trained and studied, and having developed great ears for pattern recognition, don't need to play blues with theory in mind. They knew all the traditions and classic licks of the blues, and from this humble turnaround, they learned to improvise in a highly chromatic way, but had to do it more from creative instinct than an intellectual manipulation of music theory. The great jazz players mastered uh, playing the chromaticism of the blues brilliantly. 
However, unlike the non-blues chord changes, these blues phrases weren't highly susceptible to analysis. This is why, in ways, it's more sophisticated than the parts of jazz where non-blues harmonies are employed. Again, that's stuff you can analyze, but the blues had been more or less intuitive. Then how do they manage it? Because it all comes from the blues turnaround, which more or less became the resource for improvising in a blues fashion. Let me give you a comparison of simple blues pentatonic playing and then more advanced chromatic playing. First, let's start with pentatonic. And now, highly stylized with chromatic notes and passing tones. To really dramatize how chromatic this turnaround can get, let's get a feel for a few different turnarounds commonly used. Note the chromaticism in all of them. Also note that they can either travel up or down, it doesn't matter which. Pardon that little off-topic improvisation at the end. Sorry, but the blues is kind of irresistible for me. All right, the basis of all this is expressed by the source melody that moves from the natural third of the major scale to the flat of third, to the second step, and finally to the root. In solfeggio, that would be me to me flat to re to do. Me flat is technically called May, but I don't want to get into the complications of all that here. So now, here's the most basic primal melody of the blues turnaround. Now I'm going to harmonize that melody from a third above, like so. Now, when I extract all of the original notes plus the harmonized notes, we get this chromatic string. Next, I'm going to show you the line that will harmonize against the first two I just demonstrated. Here are all three lines played separately. Now notice how chromatic all of this is. In this next example, I'm now playing all three lines harmonized together like so. Teasing out all three lines, playing them one after the other, I get this amazingly chromatic series. Alright, now finally, here's an example of all these chromatics put to use in improvisation. Now perhaps you can see why the blues can be highly chromatic and very sophisticated. 
Rounding up the three most important points about the Blues turnaround, number one, it doesn't have to be just the actual turnaround at the end of a 12-bar Blues. Number two, the turnaround can be used on each seventh chord that shows up in a 12-bar Blues in relation to the chord itself in a parallel fashion. And not only that, but on virtually any dominant seventh chord you encounter in any style of music, blues or not, in major key or minor key, it doesn't matter. Number three, the turnaround can either ascend or descend. The direction it goes is of no consequence except in the eyes of the player who's using it. The blues turnaround found its way into all sorts of pop, rock, and jazz music without being overtly stated, but instead embedded within the chord structures of the song. I've often said that if you want to find an instance of some music theory point or the other, you can find it in a Beatles song. Two songs I could think of right off the top of my head that embed the blues turnaround are the Beatles songs Eight Days a Week and You Won't See Me, neither song sounding like blues at all. Bearing in mind first that the most primal instance of the blues turnaround is characterized as a third of the major scale moving to the flat of third, to the second, and then to the root. And again, in solfeggio, that would be mi to me to re to do, and also reverses do to re to me to mi. In order to enter this discussion, I need to speak for a brief moment about what is called in music theory lines. A line is an embedded or overt stepwise melodic phrase that is most often chromatic but can be purely diatonic as well or it can be a combination of both. The blues turnaround is an example of chromatic and diatonic. A demonstration of two simultaneous lines moving in contrary motion, one chromatic and the other diatonic can be found in the rock classic Stairway to Heaven. In this piece, the lower root of the A minor chord moves down in half steps chromatically to F. The upper root moves up in diatonic steps all the way up to E. The two lines move in contrary motion according to what we're taught in the rules of counterpoint. So this should pretty much give you a rough idea of what lines are and what they can do. This particular set of lines has to do with the minor anatonic model. I might go more into the minor anatonic model later in the series because it has a certain relevance. But for now, I want to stay with the decatonic blues model because that's our focus. The blues turnaround has been sneakily embedded into all sorts of not necessarily blues music, but pop, rock, and jazz. This is something that's happened for at least a century of American music and maybe more. The most startling example of this embedding of the blues turnaround that I've ever found is in the Beatles song, specifically Paul McCartney's song, You Won't See Me. I've deconstructed the song a gazillion times. So I'm going to give you an old clip of one of my breakdowns of the song I did with my Beatles podcast co-host, James Corbett. Prepare to have your mind utterly blown away by this bit of Beatles brilliance. <laughs> Now let's talk about the second aspect of music theory that uh, needs to be covered, um, which is the blues turnaround, which I, I'm sure everybody in the world has heard, which is something like one version of it is, right? Another one is, they're all quite similar. You can go down, or you can go up. So maybe that's sounding familiar, right? So yes, that is pervasive throughout the song. And it's hidden in a covert line within the chord movement as well. What, you're ha what you have happening, first of all, this blues turnaround is a line by nature. It's moving down chromatically like that. There, there is one, one diatonic scale step in it, but most of it's chromatic. All right, so um, those are the two elements we're going to look for. Now, when we look at the chord progression A to B7 to D to A, 
we have the blues turnaround going. Well, we have the uh, actually one part without harmony. It's just. Uh, right there, you go. Right. So, against the A chord, I have. B. Da, against D. Da, da. And those notes are all embedded within each of these chords. Okay. Um, this song absolutely blows my mind because the first line first of all is going right now when we go further on down the, the line first of all let me take this line and I'm going to harmonize it in thirds right still a blues turnaround right well when we get so we have the first part that goes da da We have the A7 chord, which brings in this G note. Now we have the harmonized version of the same line going. And then it stays on that one, goes down again. And then we have, which is now the same line going up. This is amazing. This, yeah, and you have to think to yourself, how could this all have been done innocently without a ton of like manipulation yeah. of the musical material? You're just and... breaking this down since shivers down my spine. That that <laughs> that amount of information embedded in just these simple chord progressions. Yeah, and this song is all about these two principles interwoven throughout. So again, we have. Da -da. is mind-blowing it is purely mind-blowing and quite honestly i was thinking about it tonight james i was thinking about this song and what i was going to say about it and i just don't get it you know i went to music school i had a number of peers who were incredibly intelligent wouldn't they just pick up on all this material in music school and then forget it when they left because i don't understand why people are not commenting on stuff like this it's blowing my mind this is pure genius and it's one particular song and the other thing that blows my mind about this is McCartney does it once and then never does it again. It's just it's one little thought experiment. Great, did that, move on. It's like everything the Beatles did. Let's pioneer this entire new area. Entire genres will spring up from it, and we'll just move on next album. <laughs> and that's exactly what they did. They were, they were very, very restless, you know. They wanted to compete with their heroes. They wanted to compete with each other, Lennon and McCartney. And then they wanted to compete with their own selves, you know. McCartney goes, well, I wrote this, but I got I to gotta do better than that. Same with John, you know. Unbelievable, unbelievable. Now, we extend the line even further. So far we did... And... Right? Now we're going to start our line on the highest note of this D6 chord. Thank you. Uh, guitar. What's the name of that uh, guitar tab? Uh, UltimateGuitar.com. Ultimate Guitar. Right, right. All right, so we're starting on this F sharp uh, off the D6 chord. And we hear the line when, when it goes to D minor 6. So we get... As if that wasn't enough, we're on this E note. We're going to go down again. Now, what does the ultimate guitar tab say after the B7 or the B chord? Uh, B7 into E7 sus4 into E7. Okay. Um, all right, so... Uh, Yeah, this is incredible. This is truly incredible. Now, the second chord here, he stays on this, this note of the line for a bit longer. He repeats it. And then for the... So we wind up going... And that is the suspension of the A chord, which 
brings us back to that. That resolution oh, is just beautiful. Just it's just beautiful. beautiful. Being a naturally, well, lazy person, I don't want to go through the trouble of digging up the hundreds of songs that use this device. However, I know of no one song, save for You Won't See Me, that goes into it in such a dramatic and detailed way. It's simply remarkable. To quickly and off the top of my head uh, name a few songs that use the embedded blues turnaround, I would cite uh, the psychedelic classic Incense and Peppermints by the Strawberry Alarm Clock. In the bridge of the song where it goes, who cares what games we choose, that's where you'll find that happen. There's also the Chicago song, Saturday in the Park, and also the Stevie Wonder song, Isn't She Lovely. Trust me when I say this list goes on and on. The most common examples of this use the 1 to the 2 dominant 7 to the 4 or the 2 minor and then back to 1. This is a predictable sound to me and I can hear it a mile away as in the Chicago song or the Stevie Wonder song. But I really like it more so when I'm surprised. For example, in the Strawberry Alarm Clock song, it doesn't happen that way at all. It moves obtusely from E minor to E flat minor to D to A major. I just love how this one works. It's so weird. A really creative composer can come up with all sorts of variations on this theme. Even though You Won't See Me uses the more common device, I also have to mention that the way it's embedded throughout the entire piece is just remarkable. To conclude, I just want to mention why I'm constantly harping on the idea that the blues is so incredibly important. It's an American music form that should always be part of our cultural heritage, and it should be a continued tradition in the American songbook. We should never, ever lose our blues music. It's intrinsic to American culture, and we have only the African-American community and their musical pioneers to thank for it.